You as participants keep comments respectful and appropriate to the conversation. We want to hear from you and encourage comments and questions, but we'll, we will not tolerate any hateful, offensive, profane, vulgar, or abusive language. We encourage you to listen actively and attentively and be respectful of the rights and opinions of others. And we reserve the right to remove any content that violates those guidelines. And lastly, tonight's conversation is going to be recorded and will be available to rewatch and share to others afterward. All right, just a quick introduction to the podcast. If you're not familiar, um, its full title is The Movement That Never Was, A People's Guide to Anti-Racism in the South and Arkansas. It's a five-part podcast series. We're currently on episode three, written and executive produced by our first panelist this evening, Paul Kiefer. It's supported by the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation. And the series explores past anti-racism movements in the South and Arkansas, their intersections with working class movements, uh, working class solidarity, political and economic systems, and particularly the participation of white communities in these movements, all in the hope of finding a new way forward. The first three episodes of the podcast are available right now to listen to at KUAF.com. And now I'd like to introduce you to our panelists. Uh, as I said before, Paul Kiefer, he is the producer and writer of the series. He's also a graduate of Pomona College and freelance journalist based in Seattle, Washington. Uh, he was an intern in, with Durham, North Carolina Public Radio Station, WUNC, on their local daily news magazine, The State of Things, and a finalist for NPR's Croc Fellowship. Dr. Pearl Dow is the AC, Asa Griggs Handler, excuse me, Professor of Political Science and African American Studies with a joint appointment between the university's Oxford College and Emory College of Arts and Sciences. Olivia Pascal is a staff reporter with Facing South, focusing on democracy, money and politics, the census and agriculture. She previously worked for the Atlantic and holds a bachelor's degree in history from Yale University. And Dr. Angie Maxwell is the direct, director of the Diane Blair Center for Southern Politics and Society, an associate professor of political science and the holder of the Diane Blair Endowed Professors, Professorship, I'm not doing it well tonight, Professorship in Southern Studies at the University of Arkansas. Her newest book, The Long Southern Strategy, How Chasing White Voters in the South Changed American Politics was published by Oxford University's Press. Again, my name's Lee Wood. I'm the general manager. I'm going to be co-moderating tonight, co tonight with Paul. Unfortunately, Kyle Killams would not, uh, is not able to join us tonight. He had a family emergency. And he would be so much more eloquent than me. I'm sorry. All right, we're going to begin this evening with Paul uh, talking us through this last episode, sort of giving us a recap um, and handle the question of political coalition building and how it seems different in the wake of a coup attempt, which is not something I think any of us were anticipating when we were working on this project. Right, so the last episode wasn't necessarily explicitly about you know, anti-racist movement building in as much as it was about um, the history post Voting Rights Act of, of uh, working class or just broadly multiracial voting coalitions in the South and whether or not they've actually been beneficial to sort of anti-racist policy, however you define it. And it's really a history of, you know, I think people people understand that at various points post Voting Rights Act, parties in the South vied for the votes of either, you know, of white voters, especially kind of segregationist white voters in the case of the Southern strategy and for new black voters, which, you know, became a, a more substantial, much more substantial chunk of the, of the Southern electorate uh, in Arkansas beginning after the Second World War, uh, beginning earlier than much of the rest of the South. So all of that is to say, this is, you know, one could say that multiracial voting coalitions are a tool of anti-racism. You could say that they aren't because you could say, you know, it, the, the over, oh, you know, over the past 60 years, they haven't necessarily produced the kinds of changes that one would consider to be anti-racist. But what's more important is, you know, there's this question of whether voting is actually a route to change and also whether coalition building is the better, best way to make voting a route to change. And, and so that's what we're trying to explore. Um, people have lacked faith in uh, democracy for a long, long time. Uh, voting rates are, uh, voter participation is low across the country. It's especially low in the South, um, among other places. Uh, so it's not necessarily that a coup attempt 
is the first time that people's faith in democracy is shaken. Um, you know, for you know, for much of this history of the South, uh, black people, women could not vote to this day. Still, highly restricted through you know uh, voter uh, ID laws and whatnot. Um, and you know, uh, unequal access to polling stations and so on and so forth. So you know, a coup attempt doesn't necessarily isn't the first time that people will have lost faith in the notion that democracy can save the country or can make things better. But it still does frame the coalition building that led up to the last election differently, um, because you know, in a, a coup attempt that was led by a white supremacists. Uh, or white supremacist organizations, you know, very visible among the people attacking the Capitol, makes it all the more interesting that specifically in Georgia, uh, the people leading the efforts to build a new multiracial voting coalition to replace the one that died kind of slowly after the Voting Rights Act um, were black women, the, you know, the, the exact people that, you know, have been excluded from democracy from so long in the South, whereas the people who were challenging democracy were white men. Um, so that is, you know, that's the goal. The goal of the conversation here is to kind of explore the historical dynamics of, of multiracial voting coalitions in the South and the ways in which they're returning or that, you know, they're being rebuilt, um, both on a very local scale, you know, single issue coalitions um, that develop around kind of ballot initiatives, and also on a broader scale in kind of state and uh, local and national elections. Um, and then also to ask questions about, you know, who isn't voting and, you know, whether you built, you know, coalitions that are built by flipping people from one party to another versus coalitions that are built by drawing in people who haven't previously voted. So those are the kind of the topic areas that we're hoping to explore. Um, and, you know, like I said, it's not necessarily about a uh, some sort of centralized anti-racist movement as much as it is about, you know, what role does voting have in sort of the future of, of anti-racism in the South? So that's my little, my little rundown here. Um, and then we're going to move on to uh, sort of, uh, I'm going to pass it over to Lee to sort of outline things a little bit more and talk about the, the rest of the structure. Um, but yeah, that's the spirit of it. All right. And that's, yeah, that's enough. There's a lot there to unpack. And so I do think that there are some questions that I would love to hear the answers uh, that our panelists have to some question, uh, to some of these questions. So, and this one seems appropriate for the moment that we're in. And please jump in, I think, uh, if you have an answer that you'd like to share about this. Uh, this is not directed to any one person. Uh, but what, what conditions for building multiracial voting coalitions, uh, what conditions are there right now that are actually different than they were five or 10 or 20 years ago? So if we're talking, especially if we're using this, the Southern strategy, and we talk about, um, and Angie's book is about this, the long Southern strategy, so that we're not just talking about Nixon, we're actually talking about Clinton and how the rhetoric changed through those um, politicians in Arkansas in particular. What conditions are we looking at now in our state that are different than they were, say, 20 years ago? And is there anything about these conditions that would allow us to build a coalition uh, that's more successful than there were then? Or that inhibit it. That, yeah, this is true. In ways that are unique. Always the optimist. Yeah. Angie, do you see anything that's in the current state um, that's, that's very different than things were in this state five, 10 or 20 years ago? Um, yeah. I mean, I guess specifically what I would say is that, you know, Democrats have no option but a multiracial coalition. They cannot win without black voters. They just can't. Mm -hmm. There has been enough partisan sorting over the last 40 years that um, if Democrats of the past ever thought they did not have to reach to, you know, the African-American community of registered voters or Latinx voters, you know, um, that day has passed. That doesn't mean all Democratic parties in all states are doing that or doing that effectively, but, um, you know, that wasn't always the case when the parties were in the middle of flipping, you know, right. kind of as people were sorting, 
the picture looked muddled. You know, if I was talking about this in the 70s and 80s, I probably would have totally gotten it wrong because things looked purple or they looked competitive. And really they were going from one party politics one way to one party politics another way, all right? And that happened at the national level, the, sh the shift um, in Arkansas before it trickled down to kind of the state and local level. So some of those coalitions weren't really coalitions. They were parties in flux and people in the middle of partisan sorting. Now where they stand, once Arkansas kind of fully flipped um, to Republican dominance in 2012 is if Democrats want to be competitive, they have no choice but to invest in, you know, black voters and Latinx voters and, you know, practice what they preach on a multiracial coalition. So to talk about the present, could we just like center ourselves in the last election and maybe we'll go to um, Professor Dow to talk through kind of the organizing that led up to the flip in Georgia, both kind of, you know, organizing about state elections and organizing about, you know, ahead of the national election um, and elsewhere in the South and, you know, sort of what the coalition building strategy was there as opposed to sort of the influx coalitions that formed by nature of a political flip, you know, uh, 50 years ago. Well, um, the issue, or I think the dynamic that's unique here in Georgia is that the model was enhanced. So traditionally, the model has been, you register voters, right? So everybody um, is out registering, everybody's out registering voters, right? So um, people would be at churches or in front of grocery stores or voter registration cards, you turn them in, and that's it. And then a few weeks before the election, <clears throat> then you try to mobilize them to make sure they come out. And so you have this huge gap in between. And so what has happened is that with the in increased efforts to suppress voters, um, what we see happening is that organizations such as Fair Fight, the New Georgia Project, um, they fill the gap in which they sought to educate voters so it's not just that we're only going to reach out to voter to potential voters that one had not been reached out to before, um, and then also reaching out to voters that were inconsistent voters for various reasons. But we're all but they also made a conscious effort to educate voters and the public about um, what their vote can do, right? what it can change. So they're educating, they were educating about public policy. They also were educating about efforts to suppress the vote. So there's education about um, because of voter ID laws, this is what you have to have when you go vote. There was education about if you're challenged, this is how you respond. There was resources put in to make sure that there are people that were poll watchers that could provide um, real-time information to say this is what is happening on the ground. Um, there was continued education just around the basics. One of the easiest ways to, to suppress a vote is to misinform communities about when and where to vote. And so what you see happening with many of these organizations is that they spent a lot of time um, investing in informing the communities of where to vote and the date. So for example, um, Black Voters Matter um, spent a significant amount of money in the state in providing grants to community organizations uh, just to inform people where to vote. So my, my organization, my sorority, Delta Matheta, the chapters in the Atlanta metro area received $100,000 to post billboards just in the Atlanta metro area that said vote and this is the date. And that is, we don't think about that, but there are so many ways to misinform voters. And that is something very simple. So when we got to January 6th, that was the date, right? Everybody knew that date. There was not, I don't think there was a Georgian that did not know that there was an election on that day. And the fact that we have had this history of having to have these runoffs, the fact that they typically go unnoticed is a form of suppression. Um, and so I think what these organizations did was they filled that gap um, with this intense information. And it was done in a way that um, did not 
um, oversaturate, even though the oversaturation that we received really came from outside of the state. Um, but those persons that were here were doing things for, for example, um, Black Voters Matter, when they did the bus tour throughout the state, the um, two weeks going into the um, runoff, they had a collard greens and cornbread um, event. So in, in, in the Black community around New Year's, New Year's Day, a traditional meal is collard greens, peas, black eyed peas, and cornbread. And so part of the mobilization was they went to places such as grocery store parking lots or community center parking lots, and they gave away fresh vegetables and cornmeal. And they were encouraging people to turn out to vote. So tapping into those local resources, those cultural touch points um, was very significant. And it was done in a way that uh, provided information but it also met needs. We have issues around food insecurity, right? And so they, they really were able to utilize some very new ways. And then also I think what is significant is that in a moment of a pandemic um, where there are challenges with connecting with people, the use of technology was extremely um, efficient. The, um, there was an increased amount of mail, right? Um, as far as mailing, mailers, to um, people that were not, not necessarily just older voters that possibly would rely on mail, but people, all voters. Um, and so you see this use of old, older technology incorporated with new technology and incorporated with trying to engage with people and provide information about why it was important to turn out. So what seems significant here, and of course this is you know a chance for us to uh, to go kind of backwards a bit, and we'll get to Olivia in a in a minute because there's going to be some more kind of backtracking to do when we get to that section too. Um, you know, in, in this round in Georgia, the fo the emphasis was upon drawing voters who a either had been unable to vote because of voter suppression or b had you know not voted because of you know generally you know. Suppression by misinformation, suppression by misinformation, or suppression by uh, lack of information, as far as my you know, as far as my read is, and you you know, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, is there any corollary amount of effort? Was there any corollary amount of effort put into drawing white voters in one direction or another in the '70s and onwards from there by the Republican or Democratic parties in the South, and corollary efforts put into drawing new Black voters to either party? during the kind of reorganizing of Southern politics in the post-voting rights movement era. And this is probably a chance for both you, Professor Dow, and, and you, Professor Maxwell, to talk through kind of the history of that uh, kind of purple moment in Southern history, that, that kind of reorganizing, um, and also talk through kind of voter uh, mobilization efforts if they existed during that time. Does that sound reasonable? Mm -hmm. Maybe we can start with with Professor Maxwell because this is like the whole area. You know, this is you know the the Southern strategy is your area of expertise. So, would you mind kind of outlining that? You know, what spurred that that uh, that moment of, of kind of partisan uh, flip in the South and and uh, who was beginning to vote for the first time? You know, evangelicals and Black voters. And uh, yeah, I'll, I will I will do my best. Keep it super concise I can get long-winded and I don't want that <laughs> but um it, I mean you really have to kind of go back to you know 1948 you know Harry Truman makes the first spe presidential speech at the NAACP um when he does that he talks about all Americans and by all Americans I mean all Americans which was similar phrasing that Biden used in the inauguration I noticed um and you know, desegregated the military by executive order. And because of that, you know, the national, the National Democrat Party started um, moving a little bit to a kind of a, a step, took a step kind of in the pro-civil rights um, direction. And Southern Democrats um, had been in power for so long. And of course they felt at odds with the National Party. They split off in 1948 and tried to run their own candidate, Dixiecrats. The purpose of it was, in effect, to show the Democratic National Party, you better rein this in because you will lose without us, right? Except they didn't. And so 
those kind of Southern um, segregationist Democrats, including a lot of moderates, you know, were kind of in a partisan purgatory of sorts for a while, feeling at odds with the National Party. But in their home state and kind of locally, it was the only game in town. So what were they going to do, right? Um, and in the 1950s, on the other side, the Republican Party was experiencing its own fracture, mostly between kind of Midwest conservatives that were strongly anti-communist, strongly anti-labor, um, and what they saw is elite kind of East Coast, you know, Republicans that they felt were in control of the party too much. You know, their favorite candidate, the conservative Republicans' favorite candidate, Taft, was did not receive the nomination over Eisenhower. And that group starts looking for partners. How can we get bigger within our own party so that we might get one of our candidates in the Republican, you know, nomination? And they started looking toward the South because even though the Southern states were blue in the general election, they still sent delegates to the RNC. And so they thought, let's try to build a coalition here. They even, um, you know, considered trying to flip Faubus and get him involved with the Republican Party, maybe even put him up as a candidate. Um, but that was abandoned when, you know, Barry Goldwater started gaining a national reputation for his anti-labor, you know, stances. And so there was this weird moment where one faction of the Republican Party is looking to just get more powerful within their party and they're finding kind of common ground, though it's really odd bedfellows to a degree, um, with some of these Southern segregationists who are mad at their national party. Um, it all comes to a head when um, they succeed, um, this group in the Republican Party, in getting one of their Barry Goldwater candidate the nomination in 1964 in a really, you know, volatile convention. And they go on the stump trying to, you know, win some Southern states, right? To the great chagrin of a whole lot of Republicans who were like, when, why are we this, right? When do we become this party? Um, and, you know, when Goldwater loses, there's an effort to say, should we still do that? Should we still try to win Southerners to create an electoral, you know, path to victory, break up this block? And there's debate about that. Nixon kind of skates the middle. Then when, you know, Jimmy Carter wins and turns the whole South back blue, there's debate about should the Republicans give up the South? I mean, it's gone kind of back and forth. There was a moment before Goldwater in 1960 where Republicans thought, let's reach to black voters. And Nixon, um, 1960 campaign compared to his 1968 campaign are radically different. Um, but they, Kennedy's success at winning some of those black voters made some Republican strategists go, uh, that's not a winning, you know, posit that that was not a winning strategy, but it was debated deeply. Um, and then of course, after LBJ signs the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, it just becomes hard to brand the Republican Party as the pro, you know, civil rights party more so than the Democrats. And there starts to be this loyalty. Did Southern Democrats do a good job of, you know, mirroring that national party? No, they didn't. In fact, it was African-American Southerners who saw the national message and made the party, you know, their own, so to speak, you know, who flooded into it because of its national message. And then, um, you know, Republicans kind of, double down in the opposite direction. Not all, but but some. And I guess that's what I would say. Yeah, and Professor Dow, before we go over to, to Olivia to talk about uh, citizen referendum, could, we, could you talk about in the, during kind of the period when uh, redistricting in the 90s started uh, leading to a lot more black representation in Southern state houses, what impact that had on policy given, you know, simultaneously the shift of white voters to the right? 
Well, what was interesting about it, in, in particularly in Georgia, um, or in, even throughout South, it was short lived because um, once you have um, George Bush, Sen George Bush Senior, Justice Department really begin to push for these max black districts um, where you had blacks being um, pretty much drawn into one or two districts throughout the state which allow for the rest of the congressional delegation to be most likely Republican. Um, you see um, black Congress as Cleo Fields, Cynthia McKinney, um, these type that become very, um, become the face of the black um, caucus in Congress. Um, but in 90, the Miller versus Johnson is 96. So you're going to have the court cases in which there is now this push against these um, black gerrymandered districts, um, and following that with the census and the redistricting of 2000, um, those districts, those congresspersons lose. Um, many of them will win one round as a result of being an incumbent, um, but ultimately many of them would go home, um, and they are now many many of them are no longer in politics or they're serving such as Cleo Fields in, their, in Louisiana state legislature. Um, but while that was happening, particularly in a state like Georgia, the Democrats to, as at the time period of what Dr. Maxwell was explaining, they're, bec they're conservative Democrats. They are not these liberal, liberal Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, so they are these blue dog Democrats. So where you find the liberal wing of the party are black Democrats on the local level um, and those that can win seats in the state legislature. Um, but like I say, it's short lived and with the 2000 rounds, the districts are drawn very red, um, strongly red, where you see these districts, particularly I'm thinking, and then there were several rounds because there's still several court cases so there's several rounds, but the result is that these, these districts are drawn more and more red and there's now a um, partisan gerrymander, which ultimately is a racial gerrymander. So for example, um, I'm thinking of district one, which is Savannah Chatham County. Um, and that area, um, the city and the county is about 55, it goes back and forth by 55, 56% black. But the district is drawn with surrounding counties that do not allow for Savannah Chatham County, which is the largest populated county in on that coastal area, to elect a Democrat. So they have not elected a Democrat um, in several elections. And the last few that they were able to elect were um, pretty much very conservative type of Democrats. Um, and so what you see happening is that the um, this effort to have this democratic party that mirrors the um, ideology that's presented on the national level really is happening in the local area by by largely black democrats but white democrats um, as a result of what was happening in response to the republican party um, in this effort to try to hold on to um, white voters becomes even more and more conservative and so just to kind of the big picture is that even if there's kind of a, a increasingly, uh, even if even if the Democratic Party's coalition is kind of increasingly black, that doesn't lead to like on a large scale, statewide scale policy changes that that were uh, progressive in any way in, in the sense that they would address uh, racial inequality. No, and they didn't address racial equality. And what we see happening is that they become more and more conservative to where there's a stalemate or a lack of spending and where the state really becomes dependent on federal funding. Um, so, for example, um, just now, um, our governor um, has proposed to cut the Department of Health budget. Well, the Department of Health budget has been cut continuously over the last 20 years because of this idea that, well, the federal government, their supplement will cover the needs of the state. And so you see the overall quality of life of Georgians begin to steadily decline. So if you look at every indicator in, in the country of education, um, income, health, overall quality of life, Georgia, the highest that Georgia ranks, I believe in education is like maybe 
35th in the country. And that's the highest in comparison to other indicators. Um, so what happens is that, no, there's not a progressive type of public policy. It becomes one that becomes extremely conservative, pretty much stingy, pretty, a very stingy type of public policy in which there's very limited spending and investment um, in the indicators that can advance, not just only Black Georgians, but all Georgians. And so we're seeing the impact of that, particularly when we look at health outcomes in COVID-19. Okay, and thank you, Olivia, for being so patient. So parallel to all of this, there is a separate, there is a history going on in Arkansas of direct democracy that dates back, you know, to the kind of state's cultural origins uh, and that kind of winds up in contemporary, in, in kind of contemporary Arkansas being an opportunity for coalition building in a way that partisan politics are not. So Olivia is here to kind of talk through history of direct democracy in whatever way, shape or form you see fit. Would you, does that sound all right? Yes, and I uh, would love for either Dr. Maxwell or Dr. Dow to jump in when I get this wrong, because as Paul knows, I wrote the article on this two years ago, probably. So <laughs> I'm relearning it. Um, Great article. <laughs> thank you. It's one of my favorites. Um, yeah, so not to get into the whole you know, history of the People's Party and populism in Arkansas, but if you're interested, it is a fascinating history um, that I just fall over mind every time I read about it. Um, so basically, in the, at the end of the 19th century, uh, Arkansas, along with other southern states and also sort of western states like Texas and Oklahoma, kind of these like frontier states, um, has uh, a lot of sort of farmer, farm labor type parties spring up a lot of third parties um, that uh, many of them are white only. Um, some of them, including a couple in Arkansas, are biracial in nature. Um, but they're basically, they've set, it's very complicated and involves the silver standard and all of this stuff, but they've set themselves up against sort of the wealthy elite. Um, and they're these, these, pot, these early populists, um, you know, pushing for more democracy in their, in their states. Um, in Arkansas, it's a, the movement gets a little traction, that traction kind of breaks. Um, the state Democrats actually passed a law that disenfranchised, um, I believe it's like nearly over 60% of black voters and nearly 20% of white voters. It was some kind of literacy or poll tax type thing um, in the late 1890s when the People's Party was at the height of its power. And that effectively kills, you know, their chance for actually passing anything legislatively. But um, their legacy lives on in this initiative and referendum system that Arkansas has in its constitution, um, which it passed in 1920. Uh, and Arkansas is the only Southern state um, to, that allows citizens to write and pass um, both initiatives and, well, both initiatives and referendum, but also statutes and constitutional amendments. Um, so you can do a lot as a, you know, person in Arkansas, if you want to do something, or you want the people to vote on it, you can do a lot through the ballot. Um, most recently, that's been used for people may be aware, uh, raising the minimum wage um, and passing medical marijuana. Um, those are sort of the two that have gotten the most press uh, and they're you know, two very progressive things that it would be shocking <laughs> if those things made it through our state legislature, right? Um, but if you sort of rewind a little bit, you go to the mid 20th century, um, that's not how the ballot was used um, hardly at all, right? Uh, the way Arkansas becomes a right to work state is through a constitutional amendment passed by a ba uh, ballot process. So people voted on it. And the campaign for that is a pretty racist on its face about racist campaign from the Farm Bureau and some other organizations. Um, you also have, you know, primarily a white, white voters at the time because that's who was, who had access to the ballot. They passed a series of amendments during the civil rights movement that were, um, sort of aimed at school desegregation, at prohibiting that in the state. Um, and then in the 2000s, when Democrats still controlled the state chamber, uh, the family council, Jerry Cox's group, um, passed a couple of, or tried to pass a couple of um, constitutional amendments that were anti-choice and you know targeted uh, gay adoption in the state. Um, which is to say, direct democracy is one of those things that is a tool uh, and it's been used by multiracial coalitions, most, I mean, most clearly in the minimum wage um, fight. You know, that is an issue that unites people along the lines of class, uh, which is sort of how things have worked best in this state often. Um, but 
in the past, you know, it really depends on how you're able to get people to vote, who is able to vote, um, who turns out, all of these things, all of these factors. Uh, and so it's a tool that if you can push, if you can get a single issue on a ballot that doesn't have, you know, that, people, that doesn't have other signifiers that might turn people off, you're, you're okay, but it's not, it's hard to build long lasting coalitions around those kind of things, I think is what people have found, um, at least the recent users of it. Uh, I've, you know, I've talked to David Couch about this, who wrote Medical Marijuana and Minimum Wage. Um, and one of the reasons, uh, <laughs> one of the reasons they tried to put minimum wage on the ballot um, back in whenever Tom Cotton got elected, what year was that, 14? Yeah, 2014. They put minimum wage on the ballot, hoping it would boost his Democratic opponent, um, Mark Pryor, the incumbent. And it turned, Tom Cotton came out and supported that minimum wage initiative and it totally fell apart um, the coalition that they were trying to build around Mark Pryor. So it really is, uh, it's, I, I would say it's a tool that has not quite been used to its full potential yet because I don't think people have figured out how to build coalitions. Um, the other thing about Arkansas that is underlying all of this is that it's a poor state not, and that impacts not only, you know, politics and, and policy, but also I think how organize, how much organizing is able to actually happen around issues. Um, I report, did some reporting on Georgia, the Georgia election uh, in November and January, and uh, actually talked to some of the groups that worked with Black Voters Matter on that collards and cornbread um, event in Brunswick, or outside Brunswick. And, you know, one of the things they all kept saying was we had, we had funding, we had money, we had resources, people were really investing in the work that these like that we do as local already existing organizations. And that's something that Arkansas has always struggled with, and especially recently has really struggled with. As a follow-up to that, actually, are there, since you know the organizing landscape in Arkansas, you know, pretty well as a journalist, are there, you know, is there a possibility for coalitions that exist in the non-voting sense, but you know, labor coalitions, people who are organizing around COVID in prison, something along those lines that could feasibly kind of start from the from the you know from being a coalition on a small scale and then expand their prominence or visibility through the initiative and referendum system or is there any are there any coalitions that have that the kind of cohesion right now that you know if they got more money they could use that process to to, to boost their visibility that's a great question and i uh would also invite dr maxwell to jump in on this one but um i would say so most of my reporting right now is on Northwest Arkansas, so that's caveat. Um, you know, there are there are some organizations up here. Poultry organizing has been really the sort of what I've focused on the most and also some of the most active organizing re in recent months. Um, labor organizing. Labor organizing is very difficult in this state and especially in this part of the state. Um, I do think there's some energy around that. The interesting thing about Northwest Arkansas, too, is... Uh, you know, the multiracial coalition up here will look a little different than it would in Little Rock or in the Delta. Um, we have a huge immigrant population, um, both, you know, Latinx immigrants, also Marshallese immigrants, um, many of whom are, you know, the first generation to be born here now can vote. And so that's another opportunity for coalition building, I think, that um, I haven't seen a whole lot of political movement around, but I imagine will be more sort of organizing momentum around that in the near future. Um, so I do think there's opportunities. I, I will be interested to see after the pandemic how, what networks kind of stay alive and, and what, um, you know, how things, how the landscape shifts. And Professor Maxwell, do you want to weigh in on this front as well? I mean, what things are brewing in the moment in, in you know, in Northwest Arkansas that could feasibly become voting blocks or elsewhere, you know, in the state that could feasibly become voting blocks if they survive the trials and tribulations of the pandemic? Oh, you're muted, by the way. Yeah, sure. Um, I guess I'll just, you know, Arkansas is different from a lot of other Southern states because it was the last state to flip, you know, red. And it was the last state to flip red because the Republican Party in the state started in a real distinct way because that elite kind of or East Coast liberal Republican kind of, you know, faction or that's how the conservative Republicans saw them you know, they were headed up by, you know, the Rockefellers and one of the Rockefellers came here and it was a kind of, um, I mean, to say pro-civil rights is a little much, but it was, you know, 
um, it was not the Goldwater, you know, wing of the party. And so it kind of held off any kind of flooding to the Republican Party for people who were really upset about Brown v. Board or changes to integration. So because of that, it's like Arkansas is just now kind of hitting the place in this last eight years where the Democratic Party, which had been in power for so long since Reconstruction, is going, wait a second, we have to do something to gain a majority. I mean, that's the problem with one party politics. And when one party's in control for so long is that um, there's not good infrastructure and kind of investment in infrastructure um, because nothing is competitive, right? It becomes kind of a politics of personality. And, you know, in addition to that, when Bill Clinton, you know, became president, a whole bunch of Democratic Party organizers and talent went with him to Washington. And so there is a big generation gap in the Democratic organization in Arkansas because a lot of those people went, didn't come back, or if they did come back, you know, they had done the full, you know, scale up from the state level all the way to DC and were, um, you know, had just operated at a different level. They didn't come back and necessarily get as invested in running state, the state party. Um, so there's that kind of generation gap. And so Arkansas is at the very beginning of starting to grapple with this. They're at the very beginning. And I actually think it's probably gonna get harder before it gets easier for Democrats in the state um, because they, they don't have strong party chapters in every single county. They do not have, um, you know, uh, grassroots kind of fundraising in every county. Um, we they don't contest races um and that creates a real problem not just because obviously you can't win a race you don't you know there's no democratic nominee but you also get no data because the only way we know how voters lean since about 90 percent of our kansans are registered as the you know no party right? The, I forget what it's called, the non, no option. What is it? I forget the language on the ballot. Um, it's not independent. The non-optional party, is that what it says? Yeah, non-optional. Um, the only way you know where people stand is by looking at what primary they pulled a ballot from in an open primary state. And you, you know, you've got people that registered a million years ago in Arkansas and, you know, we're Democrats then that aren't now. So we have a real hole in data because we don't have competitive election, competitive, not even just competitive generals. We don't have competitive primaries, you know, is what you really need to start seeing all that. So Democrats are the very beginning of starting to try to um, do what I call like trickle up, you know, building, which is strong, local candidates and local work in races where that candidate might lose, but they get 38% and the next one gets 42 and the next one gets 43. And it just takes, you know, time. And so right now, I think the most important thing they could do is build up their recruiting, you know, technique drop some of their party filing fees which are something I think are outrageous um and you know just and prepare people to run a couple cycles I mean a lot of times we have you know they go recruit one great candidate and you know it doesn't matter how good the candidate is they can be the best candidate you've ever seen it's just hard when there's no infrastructure and that candidate might have to do it three times in a row. Right. You and know? so, yeah. And the other question that's lingering on my mind, especially given sort of the loss of the, the express loss of faith, faith in democracy that seems sort of, it, it seems too delayed, but you know, it was bouncing around all over the place after January 6th, is that, is it, 
are you under the impression that in Arkansas, uh, there is a push on the right to draw people who would not vote by principle? And is there a kind of a, you know, who basically the, the more simple question is, who is who remains that is not voting as a matter of principle, not a matter of kind of convenience or access, you know, the people who are actually kind of opposed to voting. And is there is there a push to get, you know, to convince people of the value of voting by on either side? Does that make any sense? Um, yeah, I don't know if I know their motivation. We had about 600,000 registrar Kansans that didn't vote in 2020. Um, and, you know, I think it's an interest, it's, it's a hard one to tell because some of that could be COVID. Um, you know, it's an anomaly year. You can't make any real honest assessments off of 2020. I have to tell you, you know, I mean, it's just, but that being said, you know, those, those people didn't feel strongly, they weren't pulled strongly one way or the other, which I think speaks to how, you know, we've let national politics define low, define state politics, right? Um, you know, this is a state where, you know, just eight years ago, seven years ago, BB had a 70, the Democrat governor had a 70% approval rating, right? But the national politics becoming are seeming to them so polarized, you know, I think a whole lot of people are kind of in the middle and they don't, they're turned off by the infighting. And I think the other thing that we often forget is the level of poverty that we deal with in Arkansas, because even programs that we think and that do help, you know, maybe people that are right on the cusp of reaching the lower middle class or whatever, like, you know, the Affordable Care Act, that it tremendously helps those people, but attend, you know, if the exchange program in your state is has a $5,000 deductible, it might as well be $5 million to people that are at the lowest, lowest level of income. Um, and we have a lot of that, you know, in Arkansas. And so I don't know how um, much government seems like it can make a difference. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it absolutely does. Olivia looks like you're saying something. Well, I was going to add um, one of the uh, interesting things I learned in the process of reporting out the article I did on direct democracy. I talked to Janine Perry, who's at the UVA also, um, and runs the Arkansas poll. And we talked about um, sort of the unique opportunity ballot measures have to put like policies that might seem common sense, but are often difficult to get through legislatures, you know, in front of people to actually decide on what they are, right? So like minimum wage is a clear example. If you read something that's like, an act to increase the minimum wage to $11 by January, 2021. Like, you know, you know what that means. You know, the ballot measure that was uh, <laughs> that was on the ballot this year that actually got knocked off on like eye surgery. That's a hard issue. You read that and you're like, what am I? I'm supposed to tell you, I'm supposed to vote on how, who can do my eye surgery. Like that is not a thing I want to do. But if it's a, if it's a measure that's like common sense that people understand that impacts something close to them, wages, you know, medical marijuana, um, healthcare, you know, things like this that, that people understand intuitively. Um, that's an actual opportunity for policy to get done. And even, you know, in a way, you don't necessarily have to do a ton of organizing around it. You can just put it in front of people and they'll know, oh, minimum wage increase, that would be good for me. Yes. You don't have to go, you know, do a door knocking campaign as long as people are already coming to the polls to vote. Um, so in that way, you know, I do think in a, in a, uh, when the INR, the initiative and referendum was passed in the early 20th century, um, there's this like remarkable quote from an Arkansas historian who said something along the lines of, you know, the sentiment was that the legislators in Little Rock, um, spent too much money and stayed there too long and didn't actually do anything. Um, and I think in a situation like that and in a situation sort of now where every politics, even if it's not that way on the state level, which are usually here it is, um, when politics is so polarized, a way to sort of slide issues in under the door and get them actually done is through something like a ballot initiative um, that is less caught up in those partisan. I just, I wanna, I wanna add one thing to that because it is important to note that 
the language of the ballot initiative has to go through an approval process with the attorney general's office. And that has resulted in, in groups having to sue repeatedly because the language tries to be blocked, right? <laughs> or they rewrite language so that it's confusing and complicated. So even though if, it, if we can get on the ballot in clear, simple language, it has this possibility, but you have to have a whole infrastructure and money behind the people and lawyers and paid canvassers to get the right number of signatures. I mean, it, and then they keep, they keep trying to curtail that and, um, you know, strength, the legislature strengthened the, you know, increase the number of signatures you'd have to get and shorten the time period in which you have to get them. I mean, all of that has to be funded. It, it, it just, it really does. Um, I think it's a huge possibility for organizing but it does need money, right. you know, as you mentioned, you know, Olivia with, you know, everything you saw in Georgia is like, that's what money, you know, can do is it can have counsel, have stuff prepared, have, you know, people paid to canvas and get signatures to get stuff on the ballot. It can do it early. So there's plenty of time to fight it in the courts, you know? Um, but to me, it's like the couple groups that, have taken that on, I mean, they've had to have national issue groups help fund them. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, you know, new pipelines that people are trying to create, but it's a lot harder than I ever, I think, honestly realized. Um, and so. To switch over to Dr. Dow, because I mean, you know, within the past, or, you know, in the past election cycle, it seems like, you know, all of a sudden the Democratic Party is going to wave around Black women organizers in Georgia as the standard bearers of the party and the people who will restore faith in the democratic process, despite not having put, you know, the National Party's money into, like, organizations run by Black women to, uh, to uh, uh, educate and, uh, and enroll voters in Georgia for the past several decades. What's the significance of, of you know, this sort of decision by the by the Democratic Party to suddenly, you know, like parade around Stacey Abrams as the new hope for the party. Does that actually, is there a sense that that'll actually bring a sea change in the political orientation of Democratic politics in Georgia and in the South writ large? You know, I, I, I think this is a very unique moment. I mean, it was the perfect storm, right? So you see this coalition, the fruition of it, as a result of people really being desperate for something to happen. Like this was a, such a sense of urgency um, that I think fueled what was happening. So going back to what um, Dr. Max was just talking about, the money piece, when Stacey Abrams started New Georgia Project, what was it about 13 years ago? She was ridiculed. She was sued. Um, she couldn't hardly raise money. And then when the money started coming in, um, even her fellow Democrats were like, what are you doing? Where's this money coming from? Are you pocketing this money? So there was a lot of distrust around, one, the fact that she, she was trying to register voters who had been ignored um, and that she thought that the 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 uh, future of Democrats in the South and in Georgia was not with white voters. And so to step away from that playbook that had been the response to Reagan um, really, really was this dramatic shift. And so I think when we get to 2020 and even um, a few weeks ago, you see this sense of urgency um, and I think what, what is going to be interesting is what happens because what people don't realize is that Raphael Warnock has to run again in two years. He's completing a term. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of conversation amongst Black women organizations about the work has to continue because this election is coming up in two years. And there's also going to be a gubernatorial race. There's going to be multiple people, um, particularly Black women, that are going to run for Secretary of State because that position has gained a lot of attention. So I think um, we're gonna see a lot of 
Kansas seeds around that. Um, but I, I think as far as the Democratic Party and their strategy, it's still yet to be seen if they really got it. Because even though Jamie Harrison is now the chair of the DNC and Keisha Lance Bottom is going to be, um, she's one of the vice chairs. So you see this change, but to what Dr. Maxwell was talking about, what is happening in the state, the state party is extremely important. And, and Georgia's Democratic state party has been relatively weak um, in the sense that throughout the state, the state is very different. It's like Arkansas. Northwest Arkansas is very different from Little Rock, right? So the Atlanta metro area is very different from the coastal area. It's very different from Albany. It's very different from Augusta or the Black Belt. And so you have these different areas where what the Democratic Party looks like, it can be functioning or not functioning. Um, and from a state level, it has had its challenges because if, even if we look at Raphael Warnock, um, in his race, there were 12 Democrats running. And so when you tend to have this plethora of people, that speaks to the weakness of the party. So one of the things that when, in, in the, when Angie was giving the history about the Republicans, one of the things that they did very well, particularly in the 80s, was that they recruited potential candidates extremely well. They would go into small towns and municipalities and say, you know what, you would like your poll. They would run the polls for them. And they would run these popularity these polls, or these favorability polls, and they could determine who would be a good mayor or candidate, who would be a good, and they would have them run immediately. They would put them out, they would feel them, and they would present them at the right time. Democrats don't do that very well. Democrats don't recruit very well. They don't train very well. In certain states, they, there are some um, states that have really, really strong training programs or recruitment programs. But pretty much throughout the South, it's whoever is the popular person, who is the, who's the head of the NAACP, who's the head of this, who's this person, who's that person. But they really are missing um, a lot of potential um, talent because they're not tapping into those local communities. And one of the things that I think what they have to do is a different strategy because the Warnock race, what the Warnock race and Osaf race shows is that you can win with this huge surge of this coalition, right? But what the coalition does is that it helps peel away enough voters in your red parts of the state. So it wasn't just only getting voters to turn out in your large population areas. It was in small places, Americas, Valdosta, Bibb County, all these little, on the map looks red, 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 but there's still little pockets, neighborhoods, small districts of potential Democratic voters, and that was enough to give you a win. And so they're going to have to do a lot to really recruit candidates that can attract um, voters in these larger population areas, but also that can be appealing enough to peel just enough voters off in those red districts to win these statewide seats. Um, because the challenge with Democratic in Georgia is that the house is extremely red, right? So when I talked a while ago about what happened with the redistricting and the black congressmen, congresspersons, the same thing happened with the state. So the democratic led state legislature is no more. Um, and so there's also gonna have to be an effort where the party walks and you know, chew bubble at the same time. You've got to hold on to these two Senate seats um, and then you also got to figure out how you're going to flip some of these um, House seats um, because these issues around suppression, these issues around uh, spending for Department of Health, for education, all these are in the House. These are House issues, state House issues. Um, and so I think that um, the new, which I'm not sure who's going to be the new state um, chair yet because Nakima Williams was the chair. Um, but they're going to have to really, really um, be extremely strategic, take advantage of the um, potential for resources to continue to flow into the state, um, but then also ex have a significant effort to recruit new candidates that can um, 
attract even more voters because there were still a significant number of voters that did not, potential voters that did not vote in November and even in um, January. So you're still gonna have to keep tilling the ground um, and tilling the ground and also presenting issues in a, in a climate because eventually, hopefully we will have a climate where people don't feel under siege, right? That they're not gonna feel that, they're not gonna feel the sense of urgency a life and death urgency. They're just gonna feel normal. Right. So how do you get those people to still turn out in that type of climate? In a and if, and if, if resources are limited, is there, did you get the sense watching the way that resources were distributed in terms of kind of voter education and, and voter registration that the, the party was finally giving up on white blue dog Democrats and instead looking for places of growth like, you know, Latinx communities in North Georgia or rural black voters or, uh, or like Asian American communities in, in Metro Atlanta? Or is there still a sense that some element of the party is going to hang on to the notion that, that white blue dog Democrats are vital to wins in Georgia? I think... I think looking at what's happening in the legislature, um, I think that there's a there's a possibility that that's going to be the case, um, because historically, when we look at turnout, particularly um, when it comes to the statewide races, non-presidential election years, Georgia's voter turnout across the state can be very low. Um, we have there are municipalities where mayors are elected with less than 10% of the vote. Um, and that's consistent. Um, and so I think that there's just layers of issues that have to be addressed. Um, but I think what we have to remember is that the resources didn't come from the Democratic Party. It came from everybody else, right? The Democratic Party, first of all, you know, it is their standard to say, well, we're not jumping in on certain type of races. They don't endorse. They don't officially say that they're supporting a candidate for governor. Um, but they typically do not, um, in this state, um, they, the, the mantra of the Democratic Party, the mantra of just politics is if somebody else spends their money, that's fine, right? And so I think it's going to be interesting to see how the national party begins to direct and even if they're going to strengthen the state party because during the Obama years, you know, his perspective and the DNC's perspective was kind of like they had a disdain for state parties. And so state parties pretty much lost a lot of resources from the national party. And so it's going to be interesting to see if under Harrison as the DNC chair, what the directives are going to be as far as boosting up the state parties to do the work that organizations um, do because you can't always depend on the apparatus to just come save you, right? The party itself has to do something, has to do the work. It can't be what we say, Angie, what free riders, that you just can't get the benefit of everybody else's labor. And that's what the Democrats happen. That's what happened. The Democrats benefit from others' labor. Right, and so I think going forward, that's going to have to change if we're going to see any type of continued success or any type of way, any type of efforts where Democrats are going to have these slow gains um, in the legislature, in the legislature, um, and in maybe in some of the statewide races. Lee, did you want to jump in and start doing audience questions? Well, I wanted to remind everybody on the call to please, if you do have questions, to write into the chat. Um, we haven't received any questions yet, probably because the conversation's been so riveting, because um, I'm sitting here trying to think of questions and everything's been answered. Um, but I, one thing did come to mind. So just a reminder, if you do have questions, please do put them in the chat. We'd love to um, have you be a part of this conversation. Um, in the episode of the podcast, the last uh, most, most recent episode, there is um, uh, a pretty startling, although not surprising, um, bit of audio from Lee Atwater, where he's, he's just very blatantly uh, explaining what the shift in language of the Republican Party uh, is, is going through. It's, the, it's a similar sentiment which is a racist sentiment, but instead of being on the nose racist, uh, it starts 
to become um, language about policy, about tax cuts, about um, uh, public education, and about other kinds of issues um, where uh, the stance of the Republican Party, this is Lee Atwater's strategy that he's outlining, uh, has the same ends. The means may be different or the way of communicating about it may be different, but the, the ends are the same in that black citizens will be affected worse than white citizens um, and not have access to the kinds of advancements or wealth that white citizens might have. So I'm interested to, to, well, first of all, please, Dr. Maxwell, tell me if I was completely wrong about that, because this is your area of expertise. Um, it's just a shocking quote. And I wonder, though, sometimes if, we're, if we have moved very far from that point um, in how there is so much codified language uh, that's being used that has racist underpinnings underneath it. And to add on top of that, how is is the language of Marjorie Taylor Greene or some some parallel all that different from like it does it mark an actual change from the strategy that Lee Atwater outlined in the you know in the Reagan years? Um, I mean we can uh, we can measure it and tell you no, it's not changed. So one thing one time there was a moment after the civil rights movement when political scientists measured something called old fashioned racism, which is a series of questions that ask people's, um, you know, how they rank different races on kind of racial stereotypes, like heart, work ethic, intelligence, trustworthiness. And political scientists started to notice that those, um, that white respondents were not giving such, you know, disfavorable um, you know, characterizations of African Americans. Okay, so there's a moment, and if you read some political scientists, it's like in the 70s, you know, some of them are like giddy, like they're like, these numbers are really dropping. Um, but what happened is that, you know, it became in some communities kind of social desirability kicked in and people didn't want to say those things publicly, right? Um, that became not okay. Um, some places it still was, but overall. And so there was a, you know, some other political scientists that said, is this, I mean, have we changed this much or has the nature of racial animus shifted, right? So maybe it's not stereotypes anymore but is it, you know, is it coding itself in a different language or something? And they created the symbolic racism scale of questions, which we now call the racial resentment scale. And it doesn't ask about stereotypes. It basically, you know, measures if people kind of believe in a structural racism. You know, do you think there's any long-term effects, you know, for African-Americans from things like slavery and Jim Crow? Do you think that, you know, you know, one of the questions have African, you know, have blacks gotten enough, right? It's this desire to move past race. It's this desire to go, we're done. Um, you know, and people can, you know, white um, Southerners, you know, were very high on the scale of saying like, it's time to move past race. It was like civil rights movement is over, let's wrap it in a neat bow, right? But they were also really prompted to do that by particularly Reagan's campaign, which pushed a language and a rhetoric about colorblindness, which is a really lovely theoretical concept, right? But at the same time, what it does is in a moment post-civil rights movement when it should have been about policies to help um, upward mobility for African-Americans, to help fairness and access. Um, you know, those should have been invested in. Instead of that, it was, we're done now. And we don't see color, therefore structural racism kind of doesn't exist. And I'm not saying that everyone that took up that message understood um, the message that was being put out and the reasons for it and how it was tied to, 
a lack of funding for those kinds of programs. Um, some did, some, some didn't, you know, and I think it's important. I mean, I learn every day things that had a, a racist motivation that I didn't know had a racist motivation that maybe even I was like, oh, that's a great idea, not knowing. Um, and that's, you know, the responsibility of our scholarship and our work is to understand that long history so that, you know, you don't, you know, make those kinds of judgments. So from such a place of privilege and, you know, naivete. Because I will tell you that when we look at polling data about African Americans' views on Ronald Reagan, they knew this, they saw it, they reported it, they said that absolutely this is what's happening. And there were a lot of white moderates who were like, no, colorblindness is lovely. You know, he's not, but, um, and that is a way that, you know, political rhetoric can be manipulated. Um, even to the point where people take up that torch and don't even know who it burns, right? So maybe to oversimplify things a bit, but you know, if we were to focus on white blue dog Democrats who still vote within the party, are at, in, at the moment, are they still bonded to the party by, by a belief in a robust social safety net? And do they stick with the party despite the fact that they sort of believe in Reagan's version of you know, how race in America is no longer relevant or is it what what bonds kind of all the the remnants of the old white membership in southern democratic parties to the party today well i think there are people who changed there are some i mean you know there if you're of a certain generation of kind of white male politician from the south you either flipped parties you stayed in the party and you hate the party and where it is and are in a smaller and smaller shrinking or, or some people learn and become educated and say, I didn't see that that way. This is, we don't want this. This was terrible and, and actually made a leap. You know, there are some people and there, and there are also some Southern white Democrats who you have to remember that the Democratic Party was the only option for some of them. It was all they, you know, so it's warring factions, but it was the only game in town, you know? Um, and even if they disagreed with some of the places that the part, the, you know, the, the segre, the Dixiecrat impulse of the party, it was the only option. So some of them were always more fair-minded and always more, um, egalitarian than, you know, maybe, you know, the rest of Southern Democrats seem. I think it, I think it crosses the spectrum. I think there's people that ship switched. I think there's people that stayed and are angry about where the party is. And I think there's people that moved. Um, I think all of those things, you know, are true. Does yeah. that make any sense? It makes a ton of sense. Mm -hmm. And that's very helpful. Yeah. So maybe a good place, another thing that we haven't touched on, but since we're coming towards the end, but it seems worthwhile, and this is for everybody because it's, it's you know, it's, it's relevant on a local organizing scale to a national politics scale, is the role of the church in coalition building from this point onwards. You know, the contrasting uh, the kind of uh, very in-your-face evangelicalism of Kelly Loeffler with the, you know, Warnock, the, you know, a, an actual minister, in a race kind of put Christianity at, you know, right in the face of the entire country and, you know, in, in the, the race for, for, you know, political coalition building in the South. But, you know, what role is religion playing in, for instance, poultry worker organizing, if any, poultry worker organizing in Northwest Arkansas, what role is it playing in the kind of push to kind of uh, gain foot, uh, gain a foothold in state houses, you know, how how vital is, is the church for coalition building on both the left and the right? Um, from this point onward. Well, it depends on which church you're talking about. Talking about I'll let, I'm gonna let, <laughs> yeah. you have more expertise on this than me, but. Yeah. Um, well, I was gonna say in terms of uh, some of the organizing we've seen in Northwest Arkansas recently, uh, I mean, 
not even just recently, but um, in the last few years, uh, speaking, thinking about Vence Ramos and some of their actions uh, and some of the Poor People's Campaign work, that is supported by a lot of clergy. Um, I went to this vigil uh, for poultry workers who had died of COVID. Um, I guess that was in early December. And, you know, they had a number of pastors speak, um, some white pastors, some uh, Latinx pastors speak. Um, and in the Marshall East community, uh, church is like a huge thing, you know, that that's been one of the things that they've really struggled with, with COVID restrictions on church and having that community space. Um, so I do think there is a role for that to play. I think what I have seen, um, you know, black churches have a long history of organizing um, and political activism, and political action, political activism. Um, sort of the mainline Protestant churches and some of the Catholic churches will get involved to an extent, or at least their clergy will. Um, I think, I mean, to put it bluntly, like white mainline Protestant churches, they're, they just don't have that many people in them. Um, so if you're a white mainline Protestantism and you are you know, doing social justice work, that's all well and good, but you are wielding a significantly smaller congregation than say like Cross Church um, or like Ronnie Floyd, who was you know, one of Trump's uh, advisors or was on his, like, advise his campaigner, you know, so there's, like, a, there's just a difference in quantity, I think. Um, I have not, I haven't seen a ton, I think the, the church gets involved in direct aid more often than it gets involved in political organizing, at least that's been my experience in Arkansas. I do think that's starting to change a little bit with some of the mutual aid networks that I've seen pop up, but I do think that's all still so early, and this is such a unique crisis, that it's hard to say how long lasting those connections will be. That makes sense. I think there are some questions in the chat before yeah. we run to time. I know if people took the time to write them. Yeah, and I saw one about the, about a new Voting Rights Act that could be um, uh, particularly the question is, what impact could a new Voting Rights Act have on a ballot, uh, ballot restrictions uh, movements in Georgia, Texas, and across the country? What would restore, restoring preclearance laws help combat, uh, sorry, would restoring uh, preclearance laws help combat voter suppression uh, movements today? Um, and, you know, just to kind of tack on that, what, you know, what are the conditions for a new Voting Rights Act? I mean, you know, what, but either way, who would, who would like to take that one? This seems, you know. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, the, the bill is already written. Right, yeah. it's the John Lewis um, Voting Rights Act. So the bill is already written, um, which is the Voting Rights Act with the changes to the actual. So when when Shelby um, versus Holder, the case that pretty much gutted Section Five of the Voting Rights Act, the what brought the case to the court was how jurisdictions were determined to be pre-cleared, and so there was a formula that pretty much is antiquated. Um, and that's really what needs to be changed. How do you determine who should be pre-cleared, who goes through the process of pre-clearance? And there's been a lot of um, arguments that because you have an increased percentage of African-Americans and Native Americans and Latinos voting, therefore you don't need a pre-clearance process. But as soon as Shelby V. Holder um, is decided, this is when you see the the increased gerrymandering, the voter ID laws, the movement of mm -hmm. polling locations, all of the purges, all of these things come about because there is no oversight. There is no consequence um, to doing these things. So definitely if, the, if a Voting Rights Act is implemented, is passed, um, and the authority is given back to the Justice Department to actually do significant oversight. And when we say oversight, it, what we have to understand what was so special and unique about the Voting Rights Act, and not just only the Voting Rights Act, but the civil rights legislation was that it placed the burden, it took away the burden of due process from a citizen. The government was going to sue. I didn't have to try to sue the state of Georgia with my little resources. The government was going to come in and, let, and do the litigation. And so it gives the full weight back to the government, federal government, to enforce um, the right to vote. So yeah, uh, yeah, automatically, if it is passed, um, it would change things. But I think where we're gonna see, and I haven't looked at the, the bill, um, I skimmed it a while, some of the summary a while ago, but where there's going to be haggling um, in, um, particularly in the Senate, it's going to be about the question of 
who actually has to go through the preclearance process. So you're going to see people like Ted Cruz in the state of Texas saying, we don't want to have, we shouldn't be under any type of jurisdiction. Look at the turnout rate. Look at what happened in Houston, right? So they're going to use the 2020 mm -hmm. election and this turnout, this super turnout of um, black and brown voters, um, Native Americans who helped flip Arizona. Um, they're going to use that to justify or argue that you don't need it. So it's going to be a long protracted um, type of battle. But I think that if it's going to happen, um, I know there's multiple things that this administration is attempting, urgent things that they're attempting to do, but hopefully while there's a sense of urgency and momentum um, and while there are 50 plus one votes in the Senate um, at this moment, they really do need to try to get this moving as fast as possible. And yeah, I mean, I was just going to add to that that they they really need to do it fast before the redistricting yeah. commissions yeah. do what they're going to do post census. Yeah. You know, that you 2010 Arkansas Redistricting Commission got the got the census data in February. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and how districts are drawn and everything could come under those pre pre clearance. I always think about it like, and maybe this is a stupid analogy, but it's like when, when people started masking up and wearing their mask and the numbers went down and then people were like, oh, see, I can take off my mask. Exactly. And it's like the, you know, when people argued that it wasn't needed anymore, it's because they had it that made it look like it wasn't needed anymore because it was successful mm -hmm. in lots of ways. And so it's just um, for it to be gutted and Congress not to, I mean, I understand wanting to redo the formula because there's places that need to be added for preclearance. There might be a place or two that doesn't need it. Yeah, but but to gut it without that being mandated that it had to be submitted or a timeline for it until these things, which is just, you know, caused all kinds of, kinds of problems. So I hope they, hope it's a, high priority. So to close out just really briefly, because we have two minutes. Um, we we can go over. It's okay. Can go over? I know, but, but, but not... Olivia has to go to a Marshall Lee's lesson, which, which is pretty oh, cool. Oh, excuse me. Okay, we can't go over. I told her I'd be a little late. It's fine. Oh, okay. Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> so, so the kind of closing thing, just for the sake, because there's a question about it, and we can sort of, we can make this into a good closer too. What's your, you know, everyone's prognosis for kind of post redistricting, post COVID, fate of the little bits and pieces of kind of coalition building movements that have formed during COVID, um, potentially because of COVID in Arkansas and the South in general? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start because I really do have to stick to time. Um, but I'll just say very quickly that to expect a backlash on a backlash on the fact that, you know, particularly in states where democratic turnout increased or people who, you know, I was thinking about Alabama, for example, which never had early voting. And then also absentee voting was like so strict. And all of a sudden, you know, somebody who works on a Tuesday or works those shifts, you know, could vote for the first time in Alabama, right? And so I do, I do think you will see a backlash from some state legislatures about absentee ballots and access and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I also think that, you know, I think this election was a big education process for a lot, you know, a lot of people um, that had never filled out an absentee ballot, had never paid attention to those deadlines, like Dr. Dow was saying, they went a Georgian who didn't know January 5th, the runoff. I mean, that that's something. I can't put my finger on if it's our interconnectedness or social media or whatever, but um, that awareness is is big. You know, um, and I do think more people are paying attention. Um, and sometimes things like COVID or crises of that level, you know, do um, do bear that out. Like people obviously realize that this really affects my life, right, in some serious ways. So more people are engaged, but I, I fear a backlash, and I hope that you know, people don't get complacent about access to democracy. Mm -hmm.
All righty. Who, who is next in the, who, who can, who's ready to, to go? I, I agree. I mean, we've already seen it. So here in Georgia, the legislature has already started to, they put forth um, legislation that with absentee ballots, you have to have a, um, a copy of an ID and they want two copies. I don't, I don't understand why you need two copies. So for someone like my mother, who's a senior, who the Georgia law allows that if you are a senior, you can automatically receive them. So once you fill out the application one time, you check a box, you constantly get one. So she automatically gets absentee ballot for every election cycle, um, local and state and national election. Um, so they want to dismantle that. Um, they want to also dismantle um, the absentee ballots actually being mailed out. So one of the ways that people did absentee ballots was they didn't necessarily have to go online. A lot of these organizations were sending absentee ballots to voters. Um, and some of them were even pre-filled out. You just had to check the box and sign it. Um, and so all those efforts are attempting to be dismantled. Um, so there's going to be major backlash. Um, and I think one of the things that the education on the, on the left side, the education now has to continue to educate people on the value of the local election to get that voter turnout up. And then also the value of some of these state positions, particularly the secretary of state, which is, I think is particularly in Georgia, people have seen how critical that office is. Right, and Olivia, because. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm thinking about sort of some of the mutual aid and organizing efforts we've seen, um, and also a conversation that I had with the Consulate General of the Marshall Islands in um, Springdale back last summer, where he said sort of the the COVID pandemic is really, has, he was telling me, has opened people's eyes to how truly awful some of the, you know, accessibility to healthcare and such for the Marshallese in this community are. Um, and that, you know, there was just a lot more awareness drawn to some of the things that were happening. And I think that's been true of many issues. I don't think that's just um, unique to that population. Um, and so one of the things I'm cautiously optimistic for is that some of the mutual aid efforts that have started in Arkansas in others, you know, when I lived in Durham, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a similar mutual aid effort ongoing in Durham that brought, it was bringing thousands of people in that town together who had never, you know, met each other, but were helping with diapers and food and toiletries and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm cautiously optimistic that those kinds of communities that have formed because of this crisis and response to this crisis can sort of be repurposed um, for organizing um, and for similar sort of efforts following the pandemic. You know, I'm hopeful that those things won't just end. Um, and at the very least that they've kind of engendered conversations maybe among people who would not have been involved in that kind of organizing, that kind of conversation, that kind of, you know, po political or policy discussion before. Um, so that's my note of optimism that I'll end on. I also am very afraid of the backlash, um, but want to sound optimism. <laughs> optimism is very much helpful and appreciated. So thank you so much. All right, everybody, since we need to let everyone go, but uh, this has been a pleasure and thank you for, uh, <laughs> thank you for your patience with me asking rambling questions. And uh, thank you, please. Dr. Dow. Thank you, Dr. Maxwell. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you for ever, everyone that joined us. Have a great night. Thanks. Thank you so much, everybody. Good night. Good night.